marriage and relationships is a beautiful thing somebody says you know marriages are made in heaven so is thunder <laughs> Sometimes it's some beautiful but it could turn so uh, so crazy. Every marriage it needs these three things. We need to plant good seeds, remove weeds and kill the snake. In marriage you need to learn to remove weeds. Remove weeds could also mean to learn to pick up your dirty underwear, dirty socks, remove weeds my my me that if you're a gentleman and, and you're following a lot of girls who don't cannot afford to buy clothes you unfollow them on your Instagram remove weeds could mean that you you bite your tongue it's not worth to look at Victoria who has no secrets in the mall it's not worth to look at her when you're walking with your husband or with, no, with your wife and uh, because it's not worth the fight that you're gonna get afterwards so removing weeds is practical things planting seeds is simple things it's giving words of compliments it's giving attention it's, it's giving flowers it's spending time together it's it's being nice to each other planting seeds but Adam and Eve failed at this one they didn't kill a snake in the garden of Eden there was a snake that was in that garden and that snake came and started to talk to Eve and Eve is the first snake talker she should have not been talking back to this if it ever if a snake ever talks to you don't talk back <laughs> run <laughs> it's not a good place to be in and Eve just talks back to the snake like she's like talking to somebody and the snake finally convinces her deceives Eve and disarms Eve and Eve reaches out and takes the fruit and the Bible says she gives to the husband who was with her meaning Adam was standing and observing that whole conversation how many husbands today stand idle while their wives talk to snakes how many wives today stand idle while their husbands are being tormented by snakes be a snake killer not a snake talker. God wants us to kill snakes in our marriages. Sometimes these snakes come in the form of generational curses. Where everyone that you know and you see in your family, auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, father, mother, all divorced. And marriage is beautiful. You're planting seeds, you're removing weeds and then there comes a hissing snake where one of the spouses says, I don't love you anymore. I don't know why. I don't have feelings for you anymore. And I'm gonna divorce you. I'm gonna leave you. It's a snake. Because it's exactly what happened to his mom. It exactly happened to his daddy. It exactly what happened to his grandfather. And that snake instead of saying, oh you know what did I do? You need to both join together. Begin to look for counseling prayer so that you can kill the snake of generational divorce in that family. So that your kids don't have that snake anymore. Sometimes the snake shows up where one spouse starts dealing with a spirit of rejection. And the husband gives all the love that he gives and the wife still feels rejected, feels alone. And it's not because the wife is just this bottomless vacuum, a bottomless pit, there's never enough. It's that there's some hurts and there's some rejection that has happened that has invited that spirit and that spirit wants to bring distraction in the family. And you got to kill that snake. Sometimes it's a spirit of depression where the person just literally shuts down and we can come and say come on cheer up you know turn on some funny stuff but it's a, when it's a spirit you don't just fix it with funny comedies the bible says you got to put a garment of praise instead of spirit of heaviness that means you got to come against the spirit together so that not the person is defeated but the spirit is defeated in the person come on somebody hold on hold on hold on sometimes it's a spirit of lust it's a hissing snake maybe it attacks the husband where, where you, 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 you see that he, he struggles or he battles with the spirit of lust and, and you're noticing and it's hurting you and so you may be venting it out and you say, you don't love me. I know I'm not beautiful for you. Why did you marry if you're looking at other women? But you have to understand if it's a snake that's attacking him, don't attack him. Attack with him, the snake. Your spouse is not the snake. Now that is a revelation. There is a snake and it's not your spouse. 
they will use the spouse but they are not the spouse to understand spiritual warfare in marriage you must first understand the real enemy is not your spouse even if they've done something that hurt you so deeply the real enemy is who works behind the scenes through your spouse when Peter came to Jesus and said Jesus don't go to the cross Jesus knew that it wasn't Peter who was speaking it was a snake behind Peter and he says get behind me devil Peter's like excuse me Jesus did you I thought you changed my name from Cyphus to, to Peter now you're changing it from Peter to devil I'm confused what is my name Jesus <laughs> Jesus wasn't talking to Peter he was talking to the snake that was behind the Peter Jesus affirmed Peter Jesus helped Peter but he was attacking that are you with me deliverance in marriage spiritual warfare in marriage is so so important I get this question asked more than probably I want to hear it it's when typically it's a wife that comes and asks this question she starts out saying my husband has demons I don't debate that okay great I don't know how she came to the conclusion but she's convinced he has demons and then her second question is what do I do to get those demons out of him and a lot of times wives are convinced that the husband has demons I think if you're married you're convinced one of you has demons at one particular season of your life you'll recognize there are certain things that you're like man these things are not normal these are not natural you are crazy there's no explanation for what why you do that and not everything we accuse each other is actually demonic a lot of times it's personality uh, disorders or personality differences <laughs> personality differences and personality disorders sometimes it's flesh and sometimes it's just life but there are cases where there are evil spirits operating behind the other person and they're operating to destroy the marriage by turning the couple against each other instead of turning against the enemy I had a situation that happened in our church and some of you who maybe was coming for a while in the church you, may, you might remember this testimony it's on our YouTube where one young man he came from Texas and his wife he was convinced had a demon living in her and so he came here with his wife for prayer got so excited he says I have to tell you a story and I said what's the story he says my wife has a demon I was like exciting awesome you came for prayer line great he says I tried to cast that demon out and I said well that that's even better let's work for us he says I only provoked it he says it started to manifest in the shower he says and I he says I do like you guys do it I recorded everything on the camera he said you want to see it I said no he's like it's right here I was like no 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 no. I don't want to see the deliverance I don't want to see your wife I don't want to see nobody he says she just came out of shower and he says explaining to me in details what the demon was saying and he's like and I was holding water and the phone and he's like and I was recording for the purpose of testimonies and I was like really what kind of glory is that going to give to God naked woman running around and, and, and demons speaking through her I was like bro he needs Jesus too <laughs> eventually she came for her prayer and she got delivered and she was barren for I think 13 years and after that she conceived and they came back with a child and she was completely free If you ever attempt to do deliverance on your spouse, make sure they wear clothes. <laughs> Amen. I want us to open the Bible and we will look at the story of that most of us are very familiar with the story of David and how David brought freedom to his brothers. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 37. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine and Saul said to David go and the Lord be with you somebody say amen. amen David shows up on a battle not to fight as a soldier David shows up as an errand boy for his dad to bring money to bring a food I'm sorry some cheese and some some other food to his brothers and to the general so David has no obligation to fight the Goliath Goliath opposes no direct threat to David Goliath 
is not David's problem. It's the problem to his brothers because they're the soldiers. It's Saul's problem, not David's. And I want you to see this. David comes on the battlefield and Goliath over there, who is the problem of David's brothers and Saul. But David gets involved to help his brothers overcome their battle. The whole story of David killing Goliath is actually a story of a man coming in someone's battle and helping someone else win a battle that wasn't their own. I genuinely believe when you arrive on the battlefield of marriage, I know marriage is beautiful, but marriage is also a battlefield. For some people it's a battlefield because they fight each other. But battlefield in meaning that the other person that you are marrying, the other person that you have married many times will have their giants that they're fighting will have their issues that they are trying to resolve in their life and you're coming alongside as David help him to beat that Goliath instead of beating them in marriage and I want to share with you this morning this afternoon and practically how do we go about helping someone else in our family win a spiritual battle without crippling them or diminishing or destroying them a lot of times what happens is we don't beat the Goliath we beat each other Goliath triumphed and yes we can get divorced and we can restart that but for many cases it never fixes the real issue there are cases I'm not going to go into that's not a message today on divorce and remarriage and all of this stuff but for a lot of people the problem continues the next statistic even says that the second marriages the divorce rate is 75 percent the third marriages is 80 percent the further you go the, the divorce rate goes on why because many people are leaving battlefields without Goliath's head they're leaving with their spouse's head it's their spouse that got crushed not the enemy and we can restart and we can start clean move to a new city get a get a new new person but if it's the same problem it's you find yourself in the same situation and we don't want that. I always tell people if there's a light bulb that went out in your house, you don't replace the house, you replace the light bulb. Are you with me? I want you to write this down. The first point is remember your lions before you attempt to help someone with their giants. Before David could help his brothers with their giants, David had to be aware of the fact that he had had a lion in his own past that he by the grace of God has dealt with. Before you can help someone with their issues, make sure that your own issues are being addressed and being faced. One of the reasons we love to ignore our issues is we try to shift the blame for how we are reacting, how we are acting on someone else and because our spouse is nearest to us, we blame it on them. And it goes like this, the reason why I'm angry is because my spouse is crazy. The reason why I am impatient or the reason why I do this is because they do that. If they stop doing that, my problem will be resolved. So the problem is never you, it's always them. If they clean up their mess, if they get rid of their demons and their issues, you won't have nothing. Actually, you don't even have any problems. It's their problems that are creating problems for you. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want you to come with me. Where's the water? So this is just this is you this is you hold hold it together close to you it's called your issues now the interesting part with your issues is that they're they're there you're not bothered by them and when you're younger and somebody comes and bumps in and you see the water's about to splash you distance yourself from those people if it's your brother and your sister you're like i won't talk to you no more why? Because you're provoking something. You make me act crazy and so I won't talk to you. If it's friends, you just block them, disconnect with them. But then you get married and the person next to you keeps doing this. Five minutes. I'm going to get ready in five minutes. 20 minutes. You always say five minutes. Why is it taking you 30 minutes all the time? You're lying spirit. I rebuke the lying spirit in you in Jesus name. Mm -hmm. Now the crazy part is this, when you got water all around you, guess, guess whose fault it is? Of course the person who bombed you. But remember this, I never put the water in the cup. I only expose the fact he has had water in his cup. If he would have no water, 
Look at this. Nothing comes out. Your spouse provokes the issues you got in you that God wants you to deal with. I remember I had that with, with, with my with my brother won't mention which brother there's only two it's not hard to ask by the way and so and then one particular brother when I was not married and he one time drove me crazy so crazy we had to translate for my parents and he didn't want to translate he just acted like he didn't speak English and so I had to step in and, uh, and translate it for my parents and I was like man why couldn't you do it man you never do anything and I was like and I just got so mad I remember I go to the restroom I sit in the restroom now and I'm just like my blood is just boiling inside and I hear this still small whisper the Holy Spirit says Vlad you're such an angry person and I said no my brother is just insensitive disrespectful rebellious child like he never respects mom and dad and I see here the Holy Spirit say you're such an angry person and I said if it wouldn't be for my brother there would be no ounce of anger ever coming out of me he says has it ever occurred to you that maybe I use your brother to reveal to you that I see the anger in you every day you don't see it therefore you don't deal it and I want to show it to you but you can't even receive what I'm showing you because you're blaming it on somebody who bumped into you how could you see any other way if I wouldn't let him bump into you you can't fix someone until you acknowledge the fact that the water that came out of the cup is not their fault now they have a fault they should be careful not to keep bumping but you should also empty your cup you should also deal with the issues that are inside of you. Come on somebody. Are you with me? I want you to see what Jesus Christ said. He said to people who want to go fix everybody. I want you to see what he says in Matthew chapter 7. Is he says that before you go about, he says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye and look, there's a plank in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly how to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus is saying, in fact, is if you keep blaming the other brother or your wife for the fact that the water came out, Jesus says, you know what? Honestly, why don't you first clean up the cup, make it empty and then if your brother, sister, wife, husband bumps into you, he says we can deal with the bump because we don't have the water being splashed. Many of us, we blame our reaction on the action of someone else. In reality, your reaction is a result of your character, not whoever bumped into you. In order to help someone with their spiritual problem, we have to first be watchful that we are taking care and we are owning up to the issues that are surfacing in their heart because of their problem. Are you with me? You know, I did not know how impatient I was and how controlling I was until my wife did not want to pray as I prayed. She's supposed to be like me. She's supposed to pray like me. And I was trying to, I've shared with you last night, I was trying to pull that flower instead of water that flower. And she wasn't growing. She was dying because of that. And I thought that it was just a spiritual issue. It was a spiritual issue and I wasn't helping. Are you with me? Thank you, Eric, so much. It will dry up. Don't worry. <laughs> Appreciate your help. When people came to stone a woman with an issue of blood, uh, I had a person who volunteered. <laughs> they wanted me to use them as a Goliath. <laughs> Do you want? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Woman was caught in the act of adultery, which is interesting too because in order to have an adultery, you have to have a man. The man never made it to the stoning. <laughs> I think the man was one of the Pharisees reported the woman and he himself picked up the stone besides the point people gathered together with stones and they decided to throw uh, stones on this woman to help her of course you know to get her out of the society and everything and Jesus came alongside I want to show you something every time you want to help someone with their problem who you're married to your opinion your advice your insight could come out as this cold hard and actually painful ask Job's friends they didn't want to hurt Job when they shared their insight on what Job's problem was 
Did you think they came around? They just want to like hurt Job? No, they wanted to help Job. But somehow, you know, Job was hurt by their devices. Why? Because anytime you give this before you get this, even if what you're saying is correct, it will hurt people. Because it will be projected in the tone of your voice, in the tone of your attitude. Your words might be correct, but they're cold. They're hard. And that's why Jesus said, hey guys, um, uh, first of all, you're aiming at the wrong person. This belongs in Goliath's head. You're about to throw at the woman's head. Wrong head. Before you start throwing stones, why don't you pick up a mirror and start remembering where you came from. Remember that when you sinned, God didn't throw a stone from heaven, but had mercy on you. Before you go and fixing someone else and you know how they should get fixed and how they should change, why don't you pick a mirror and just look at the fact that Wow, I'm a big actually in this. Oh, one is magnifying glass, okay. Why don't you... <laughs> Make sure you pick up the right mirror. Why don't you look at the fact that... And remember and how God delivered you from drugs. How God delivered you from, from the depression. How God delivered you from that spirit of tradition. How you wrestled. How you struggled. How other people showed you mercy or how people didn't show you mercy and how it really hurt. And when you looked in a the mirror, then you look at your spouse. You look at your family member who's currently struggle. It's crazy how this hard, true advice becomes graced with grace, mercy and patience. And you no longer condone their issue, but you come around with a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of grace spirit of patience, spirit of long suffering, spirit of love and kindness. You come around and you actually end up helping them instead of hurting them. Are you with me? For those of you who are carrying a lot of stones and who became a crazy amazing stone hitters, I ask you today that you stop throwing stones and you pick up a mirror and you take a good look at what God has done in your past because it will surface mercy in you grace in you. You know one of the reasons why David was not judgmental and he didn't come trashing his brothers, trashing Saul is because David remembered if it wouldn't be for the grace of God he would have been a lion's lunch. If it wouldn't be for the grace of God he would have been a bear's lunch. It's only the God who helped him to overcome the bear and the lion. It wasn't David's slickness. It's not David's own strength and power. And so he's looking at the Goliath. He says, guys, I know you're struggling. I know what it's like. I've been there and I'm going to help you. And that help actually proved to be helpful to his brothers. They were not eventually offended. They rallied around him because a man who fought his lions becomes anointed to help others with their giants. Amen. Secondly, you can't kill Goliath by throwing stones at other people. You can't kill Goliath by throwing stones at other people. I want you to see this what happened is that after David comes on the battle and David recognizes that I have a history. I have walked with God. I have seen the, the work of God in my life. I have seen the Holy Spirit move supernaturally. I've seen God and now I see my brothers. They're facing a battle and I can help them. I can come alongside as somebody who has experience. Not somebody who's arrogant because of his experience but humbled because of his experience. And I can offer some help. And David is very, very wise about his brothers because when he told his brothers about the idea of killing a Goliath, his brothers flipped out. They right away start questioning his motives. They said, who do you think you are? You have an evil motive. You're here to see the battle. I think David's reply was like, what battle? <laughs> you guys are a bunch of cowards. Battle? The guy's been screaming at you for 40 days. You're not fighting. What is there to see? That you guys are a bunch of losers. David never said that. He could have. Did you know why David never accused his brothers of being cowards? He was reserving his stones for the head of the Goliath. Never waste your stones on the people. Then you'll have none for the Goliath's head. <laughs> you know why sometimes we don't have any more anointing to fight the real enemy? Because we waste it on the wrong enemies. We waste it on the enemies that the devil tempts us with because the devil wants to drain you of the anointing.
that God has given you for the Goliath's head so he sends you brother sister husband wife kids neighbor a boss ex-christian or or a fellow Christian or people who are hypocrites in church people who provoke you and what you want they want to get under your skin they pull your nerves and you want to reply you want to create that video on Facebook to show how dangerous those people are how bad people can be how Christians are such a stumbling block to other people growing you really you're just raging but in reality it's actually a trap Satan want to milk the anointing so when you face the Goliath you ain't got nothing left sometimes the best thing you can do is not to reply sometimes the best thing you can do let them think they're right let them think they won the battle but you got the anointing so what that you won the argument but you lost the grace you lost the peace yeah you proved everybody right yeah you even backed up with the scriptures but is really that fight was worth it because David asked the first question before the battle of the Goliath he says what will I get if I fight this man not every battle that presents itself to you you have to take it some battles have no spoil some battles have no reward I can prove to you skunk every person in here can beat a skunk but before you go start a competition with a skunk you have to ask yourself a very important question is the smell worth the fight you can beat the skunk I don't doubt that there's anointing on your life to beat skunks the question is do you want to live with the smell of skunks for the rest of your life no you don't and there are some people in our life certain situations honestly I'm just gonna say it the way it is skunk situations devil sets us up there and we feel great because we want to fight God created us to fight and we beat it we beat it and then we walk out and like yeah I beat it but you don't get a trophy you only smell like that thing God wants you only to fight battles that have spoil and that's not with your spouse that's not with our friends sometimes the best thing we can do is to walk away bring a resolution because a real enemy is Goliath not each other are you with me church are you with me church hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Lord so what do you do you attack the issue and affirm the person you attack the you you affirm the identity you attack the issue Giovanna can I borrow you for just a second you know somebody would see Giovanna about two years ago and see her living um, in a life of alternative lifestyle and a life the way she dressed the way she talked the kind of girlfriend she had and people would be very quick to throw stones I'll say look you're lesbian look you're like that you're such a bad person but see the Holy Spirit doesn't see a lesbian he saw a woman of God and when uh, when about two years ago Giovanna came what the Holy Spirit did is he attacked the spirit of homosexuality it's a spirit it's not just a same-sex attraction he attacked the spirit that was hurting her without hurting her we love Giovanna we didn't hate Giovanna not not a bit but when she was delivered when the evil was removed the beautiful person that was there all of those years is the beautiful person now that signs off every person's t-shirt who wears it as a volunteer And you look at her today and during worship as we were just worshiping and singing about beautiful name it is and I kind of glanced at Giovanna and I remember at the race to deliver when she was going through her deliverance and I, all these pictures just flashed how three days God was delivering her tears still rolling down my eyes and I said only Holy Spirit can see the identity and remove the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Good Work with Holy Spirit. People are good. They're created in the image of God. And whatever evil that's tormenting them, whatever evil that's hurting them, we can together with them and the Holy Spirit come against it without destroying the person. Don't be like that crazy person who just throws rocks. It's like Holy Spirit, you just differentiate where they go. <laughs> be careful who you affirm and who you attack. We affirm the identity. We attack the issue. We speak life to the person. And we come against the real enemy and the enemy and the person are not the two things sometimes the enemy can temporarily possess or oppress or link himself to the person but they're not the same amen 
as we're bringing this message to an end, I want you to see a third point. There is only one name but many stones that can defeat Goliath. I want you to see that when David came up against the Goliath, he finally got the permission from Saul. He walked away from his brothers. He didn't want to create a fuss with them. And then David finally comes up against the Goliath. And Saul says, hey, before you get there, uh, David, let me get you my coat. Um, because this coat, many victories happen here. It's not working for me today, but, but it might work for you. Just try it. And David put it on and he's like, man, I don't know, just, just, I mean, it's great, looks great and stuff. It's good for the pictures. <laughs> Edder, Edder, where are you? Okay, Edder, no, here we are. And so it, it, it's, it's good for the pictures. It, it's, it's really nice. And, and honestly, it makes me kingly. It makes me like a soldier. But, but Saul said, um, I, I don't, I don't know, it just doesn't, doesn't feel right. And then Saul is like, what do you mean it doesn't feel right? You can't win a battle if you don't wear my armor. And David says, well, it's been four years your armor hasn't been really working for you <laughs> it's great I'm not against it but um, it's not working for you why will it work for me let me put it aside and let me just go um, and uh, we'll just go like that he didn't look like a soldier it wasn't conventional but the interesting part is God brought freedom and victory. I want to shatter a Pentecostal, charismatic, and a Baptist way. This is the only way God brings deliverance. They have to be in a prayer line. Otherwise they'll never be free. If they don't confess the root sin, God will never set them free. If you don't stand in your authority and you always plead and beg, God will never give you freedom. And I understand where this is coming from. It's good. God gave you that grace. But you know that the God we serve is actually bigger than Pentecostals, than Charismatics, than the Baptists, than our brother Catholics, than Presbyterians. Our God is bigger. I meet people sometimes who, who for example they have a child that's not serving God and they fast and pray, fast and pray and then you see finally many many years later their child finds Christ. I know a mother who comes to her church. She didn't do that. Her child wasn't serving God. You know what she did? She prayed one prayer and she said, God I give you my child and you are gonna find them. You're gonna bring them and she said I felt peace and ever since then I only thank God that God is working on them and everything is fine and I continued praying for other people. The other person met with them and says, you can't do that. You gotta pray like I pray. You gotta fast like I fast. But sometimes one person's armor is another person's slingshot and God can use both. Never limit what God can do. I believe in deliverance and deliverance has to happen the way we have it happen. You come for screening, you get prayed first, you get confessing your sins, you get led through prayer. But sometimes people get delivered in their own car. I know how God touched my brother. It was at his own bed after an accident. God just visited him and something snapped. For years we prayed for him. I know one mother in the Bible, she had a demon-possessed daughter. I'm not sure if her daughter knew that she was demon-possessed, but she came to Jesus and this mother, she did not understand about the authority of the name of Jesus. She came begging Jesus for mercy. And Jesus didn't say, you're not naming and claiming, blabbing it and grabbing it, confessing it and possessing it. I'm not going to give it to you. He didn't say, you don't know your authority. You're not a child that sits at the, at the table and receives I uh, know no, nothing for you. And she says, Jesus, I'm not your kid. I know I'm not sitting over there with your children. I don't know who I am in you. I am not part of the covenant. I'm not one of those people who knows their authority, Jesus. I'm just a Gentile, but I'm just broken. And I know that you have the solution. Please, if you don't let me take it from the table, I'll lick it from the floor. Drop me a crumb. And Jesus says, for that statement, your daughter is free. And the daughter was instantly free. There are people who take it from the table. And we're those people. We teach people to know who they are in Christ. But we meet people who that revelation doesn't hit them. Never shame someone who doesn't walk in the level of your revelation. 
we need to grow we need to encourage people but there are people who will come with their revelation and their revelation is this whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved and they say I call upon God I ask for his mercy for my children and they're Baptists maybe they don't speak in tongues and chase the demons all around town and breaking spiritual principalities and anointing buckets of oil over their house they're just simple and kneel and before the bed of their child and say God bring my wayward child home and you see a few months later God brings their child home you're like how is that I claimed, blamed, I named it, claimed it, blabbed it, grabbed it, confessed it, possessed it. I took it all. I did the whole nine yards. I got the new anointing oil, the old anointing water, the new oil, the old oil anointed me. I got the, the virgin oil anointed to me and, and nothing was happening because you put too much hope in the armor and the stones and the, and, and the sword. You have to take all of that off and understand one thing. There's only one name that brings freedom but many different stones. Many different ways the Lord can bring that freedom. Church, you know we're more vibrant. We love to confess it. We like to rebuke the devil. And I think what we're doing is super. But maybe you're coming here today and you're not used to that. Maybe your way of approaching God and approaching freedom is more you don't dare to speak against the devil and that's okay. Let's work with what we have today. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. It is not even your declaration. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that will move today to bring freedom and to bring deliverance. In Jesus' name.